Hey, I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome. Um, you know, last week we uh, were able to kind of do kind of a standalone devotional. I told you last week we we're going to start a series about marriage. And, and listen, um, if you're new, um, if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're widowed, if you're uh, married, happily married or unhappily married, I'm glad that you're here. This, we're going to look at the biblical, biblical perspective, and I think um, we're just going to jump right in. We're going to pray, and we're going to jump right in. So let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray together. God, will you speak to our hearts tonight? Lord, um, you have wonderfully and fearfully and incredibly made us, each of us. Uh, for some of us, you've blessed us with a spouse. For some of us, maybe not yet. Uh, maybe some of us have, have kind of looked at marriage. Probably all of us in this room, I know all of us, including me, we've looked at marriage the wrong way. And so God, will you allow your word to speak very clearly to us tonight? Um, we're looking forward to this series. And Lord, I just I pray that um, those of us who are married can have strong marriages and be an example for those who are not. Those who aren't married, Lord, I pray that they will be able to look at marriages and see God in them and grow in their faith from seeing a godly marriage. So God, speak to our hearts tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to welcome everybody that's also listening online. So we're glad that you're here. Um, today, I gave you a handout. Today, we're going to kind of do an introduction. We're going to talk about the purpose, the power, and the paradox of marriage. That's a good Baptist three Ps, right? Purpose, power, and paradox of marriage. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, if you know anything about the Bible, uh, God talks a lot about marriage in Genesis. Jesus talks a lot about marriage in the Gospels. And then Paul talks a lot about marriage in the epistles. So we're going to get to all that in the next several weeks. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the purpose of marriage, the power of marriage, and the paradox of marriage. And really have, let me just kind of talk about goals. Because I know anytime I start talking about marriage, some people just clock out because they say, well, I'm not married, or my marriage is a disaster, or I'm widowed and I'm never going to be married again, or, you know, whatever. Um, or I'm happily married and I'm good. I don't need to hear about marriage. Well, all of you are wrong. <laughs> okay? I mean, we all need to see this. because let me, So let me kind of give you some goals. First of all, I want us to align our thoughts about marriage with Scripture. The world has given us a lot of stuff about marriage that's just absolutely wrong. So I want us to align our thoughts about marriage with Scripture. And I think as much as even those of us who maybe are happily married, as much as we think we've con con corrected for our culture's misunderstanding of marriage, folks, our instincts are wrong most of the time. I'm just being honest with you. I know mine are. Um, and even studying this this week, it's, I'm not going, man, I've missed that. Or, man, I struck out there. Man, I didn't do that right. Um, and so my wife's here tonight, so I'm glad she's here. We're going to hear this together. Um, and so, you know, I think probably for most of us, our, our, our concept of marriage is maybe based on our parents. And that's not completely right. Maybe our concept of marriage is based on... Um, what we see on TV, that's not right. <laughs> Our job is to listen carefully to Scripture and, and re retain, re retrain our instincts and retrain our assumptions to be closer to Scripture. And that's what I hope will come out of this, uh, this Bible study. Secondly, I want you, and listen, this is for everybody, I want you to see the beauty of marriage. Let me just kind of say, I, I look around the room and I know there are people in the room who have, who've lost their, their spouse. There are people around the room who have been divorced. There are people in the room who are married. There are people in the room that are struggling in their marriage. There are people in the room that are single, never been married. And there are people in the room who have lost, you know, a spouse. There are people in the room who maybe, you know, been married multiple, multiple times. There's a lot of people. I want us to see the beauty of marriage, um, as you understand God's design scripturally of marriage, whether you're married or single, you're, you're absolutely going to marvel at the wisdom and the perfection of God. So anything that kind of helps us look at God and see his wisdom and perfection, I think is a good thing. So my hope is that what will emerge out of these teachings 
um, will not, this is not just a how to do your marriage right conference, <laughs> okay? If you came for that, you came for the wrong reason. I really don't, I mean, those are good. I'm not talking bad about those. But I want us to have a renewed sense of how amazing this God who calls us his own really is. That's what I want us to do. Um, now, so let me call, kind of talk to a couple of different folks here. Some of you are not married for whatever reason. Um, and you're probably going, I'm never coming back. I'm just going to skip the next 10 weeks and I'll come back when y'all start talking about something that means something to me. Please don't do that. Um, this is very much meant for you. Um, this will help you uh, make this. this will, uh, let me kind of give you some tips that will help us make some good use of your time for those of you who are not married in the room. Uh, first of all, you probably have some friends that are married. And I'll pick, I think it will help you um, to consider the marriages of your friends. Um, this class will help you love them better, understand them better, and pray for them better. That's a good thing. Secondly, for those of you who are not married, um, maybe some of you, who knows, never say never, maybe there's a future marriage for you down the road. This will help you understand what that should look like, and it'll shape your, your views of dating. It'll shape your views of who your spouse should be and help, help prepare you for marriage. And thirdly, and this is maybe the most importantly for you single folks, this will help you consider the beauty of what God has designed. Remember, church, listen to me. Married folks, listen. Marriage is a temporary institution. It's a temporary institution. In heaven, God's going to have something better than marriage for us. Now, maybe some of that, that wigs you out, but that's scriptural. Okay, so I want you to understand that. So um, this, this is a temporary placeholder, and I love my marriage, but I know God's got something a little different for all of us in heaven. And so um, that, if for you single people, this is why you need to stick around and hold, hold on to this. And, and, of course, some of you here are married. Let's see, let's just do a survey. How many of y'all been married more than 30 years? Raise your hand, okay? How many have been married less than 10 years? Raise your hand, okay? So a few of you, all right? So, so here's some tips for you about this class. Now hear me closely, uh, husbands and wives. Don't let this ideal scriptural marriage course discourage you. Don't walk away going, oh, man, I struck out in every one of those areas that Pastor Dave was. You know, I don't, 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 don't let it discourage you. Um, if you've been married for a while, your experience in marriage, you know that you've fallen short of what the Bible offers. You know that because you're human, right? And so don't let it discourage you. Secondly, um, please do this. Please do not do this. Do not use this class as leverage for arguments with your spouse, I do not want to hear, well, Pastor Dave, I don't want to be included in your arguments between you and your, you know, spouse. I just, I, please, let's not do that, okay? Um, do not, or do, here's what you can do. Use this class to examine your purposes for your marriage in light of what Scripture says. I want you to do that. I want you to look at your marriage in light of what Scripture says. And if you're doing that, you're going to grow in your marriage and you're going to grow in your relationship with your spouse. Uh, and that will be especially relevant today in today's message. Um, you can use this class also to kind of mirror your own attitudes and your own instincts and your own assumptions and your own struggles in your marriage. Um, so here's what I want you to do, spouse. Don't, don't, when I say something or when I read something or when I make a statement, don't look over at your spouse and go. <laughs> don't be pointing at them, point at you. I, I want this to help you because when you're a better spouse, you're going to have a better marriage. Now, and that's, this is the guilt. I mean, we all want to just kind of, you know, hunt, you know, you know, you know, do this. We, that's what we want to do. But let, let's make this about really you. It's not about your spouse. It's about you. So we're going to turn to Genesis 1. And two, we're going to read a couple scriptures. Let's first talk about the purpose of marriage. 30 years ago, on May the 9th, um, I stood across my beautiful bride, Leanne, in a church in Jonesboro, Tennessee, at Cherry Grove Baptist Church. And, 
in front of a lot of people, and we made some promises to each other um, as long as we both shall live. Um, and then all of a sudden, we were husband and wife, right? You all went through that process as well, probably with some of you. Um, and I'll be honest, just being married is, is a great part of my life. Um, it's, it's been a testimony of the mercy and the goodness of God. Lena and I have had ups and downs. Um, you know, we've had all kinds of experiences. But it's, it's really been the best part of my life. And, and I've been married now more than I've lived. I mean, right, I've been married more than I've not been married in my life, right? And so, so why did we get married? Right, I mean, that's a question. Why did we get married? Um, one, and I'll just kind of give you my personal opinions, I wanted to stop leaving her house around 11 o'clock and having to drive back to my house. I was kind of getting sick and tired of that. I wanted to kind of, you know, just hang around with her, and she was beautiful, and she was gorgeous, and I loved her, and we wanted to have a life together. We wanted to have kids together, and we wanted to do ministry together. That's, that's why we got married, right? Um, but there was really a deeper purpose for that, and I think if you really think about when you get married, there should be a deeper purpose in our marriages that I probably, I don't think we fully understood at the moment and probably still don't completely fully understand it but I think there is an understanding more now than there was earlier uh, it's beyond kids it's beyond companionship it's beyond all the ministry and it's really maybe the greatest reason for the joy in our marriage and it's the purpose that we see at the beginning of the Bible so if you look with me in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 uh, Jesus had, or God had made everything, the Godhead had made everything in the universe. And God says this in verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Our is referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian view of God, God, one God in three persons. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so then he does just that. And so in verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So just a few things from this scripture. This is a scripture you've read before. This is a scripture you've read about creation. But let me just kind of notate a few things about marriage in here. First, what you see here in verse 27 is really kind of our purpose statement as human beings. How many of y'all would like to have a purpose statement? Well, it's found right here in Genesis 1.27. We are made according to God's image. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, we're made in the, according to God's image. And that's why we exist. We don't exist first and foremost because God needed us to do something for him. No, he didn't need us to be, he didn't need us to be fruitful and multiply he was doing just fine filling the earth by himself. He didn't really need us to do that, right? And so I want you to understand that. He didn't need us to exercise dominion, as verse 28 says. He was doing fine just by himself. No, he made us, according to the Scripture, according to his image. That's what he did. He made us as his representatives. And so you point back to the kind of the wonder of who he is. And so think about it. You should reflect God. How are we doing with that? Should be convicting, right? Uh, we were, you might think about it this way. We were made according to his image. And that's kind of two kind of pieces of that. Perceive and portray. Those are two words you might want to write down in your notes. Perceive and portray. Kind of like a mirror, right? You portray an image and you perceive what you look like. We perceive because we're made in his likeness, we can understand who he is from our own experience. We perceive God as, as what we were made. And we portray, and so by people looking at us, we should portray the image of God, right? So that's, that's kind of the reason he made us, and so that's our purpose. Secondly, what we get out of this scripture is that when God made man, he made male, and this purpose of perceiving and portraying was for Adam and then Eve together and we're going to see that a little bit more in Genesis chapter 2 um, 
and how, that ha- how this happens through marriage. So if you're not married, listen to me, if you're not married, you're just as completely made in the image of God as someone who is married. Understand that, okay? We're all completely made in the image of God. And there's nothing lacking, listen, listen single people, there's nothing lacking in you just because you're not married. Understand that. And we're going to talk about how that works between a husband and wife a little bit later. And so this is a part of our purpose. We see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, you don't have to turn there, but we kind of see this. There's this unique way in which a, a married couple can perceive and portray God just as there's a unique way in which someone can serve Christ and when, when we're married. We, you know, sometimes when you're single, you can serve God in a certain way. And when you're married, you can serve God in a very uniquely different way. So I want you to observe this. This is just some observations. Thirdly, God's command in verse 28 there in Genesis chapter 1 to be fruitful and to exercise dominion in his blessing when God blesses in Genesis, if you read throughout the book of Genesis, be it the, whether he blesses the animals or blesses the Sabbath day or blesses Noah in chapter 9, he's explaining how his purposes will be accomplished and there's, there's no exception. So the purpose is, is God, we've made in God's image and then we work that out in verse 28 through our love and our labor, through our relationships and through our rule. So we work that out in our work, we work that out in our family, we work out these things. And so... Jesus, again, didn't need us to be productive. He was pretty productive by himself, right? But because that's how we reflect him and and he made us in his image, we get to be productive. So just notice these things in the scripture. And so it's it's so easy for us, listen, this is how we value marriage a lot of times. If if you just go up and ask somebody, hey, how's your marriage? People are going to start talking about, oh, we're blessed. We have a house. We have kids. We have a dog. We have jobs. We go on vacation. We talk about stuff we have, right? And so a lot of times we value our marriage, listen, on what it produces, don't we? That's how we value our marriages. And so it gives me happiness. It gives me companionship. It gives me some kids. It gives me some stability. It gives me some foundation for ministry and community. And all those things are true and all those things are good, but the deeper purpose for marriage has God at the very heart of it. Our marriages should reflect who God is. I don't know about you, but that's convicting to me. Amen? It should reflect who God is. The deeper purpose for marriage is that the key way in which we perceive the glory of God and portray the glory to ourselves and others is how we live out our lives in our marriages. And so we see this continue on in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Turn there, if you will, with me. Because this is where God says in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, it is not good that the man should be what? Alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, listen, we've misinterpreted this scripture for years. In our modern Western kind of perspective, it's easy for us to read that and say, oh, there was a problem because Adam was lonely. Okay, that's not what this scripture really means. It doesn't, that doesn't do justice to the text here. This is Bible study 101. The problem was that Adam was not lonely, he was alone. There's a difference. Okay, there's a difference. By himself being alone, he couldn't do all that God had commanded him to do. Think about it. Let's just think about it biologically. (laughs) Adam couldn't be fruitful and multiply alone. Amen? Takes two, right? Uh, y'all with me biologically? Okay, I, I, I'm just making sure you're with me. So, so, so he couldn't exercise dominion by himself. So by himself, he couldn't live out what it means to be made in the image of God. Now, don't, don't, single person, don't say, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just worthless. I can't. No, no, no. God has a purpose for you. But I think you see in the context of Adam being alone, being the only man in the world he couldn't carry out what God wanted him to do. So 
Paul kind of talks about this a little bit. You don't have to turn there, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about this a little bit later in the New Testament in Ephesians, in his great teaching on marriage in Ephesians 5. Um, we'll, we'll be all over Ephesians 5 later. Um, but he says in verse 32, he says, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And so Paul here is saying he's looking deep into this beginning of all things and sees there that marriage was built not so much to be an analogy, but marriage was built to perceive in new ways the glories of God and the love for us. And we live it out in our marriages. We live it out what Christ is to the church. I mean, all this whole analogy in the Bible of Christ being the bridegroom, right? And who's the bride? We are, right? And this analogy is all throughout Scripture, and Paul kind of alludes to that. And the problem here is, you, you kind of say, okay, Pastor David, I get it. You know, I know our marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. You know, as the husband, I'm kind of acting like Jesus, and my wife kind of acts like the bride, the church. And we, you know, we, I get that. But, but really, I want you to understand, again, some of you are going, okay, David, that's real spiritual, that's real theological, but I want some, how, how do I make that happen in my marriage? You know, how does that play out in my marriage, right? For some of you, I mean, you're probably asking that question. And I get that, but one of the ways we can make this more practical is understanding who the audience is here. This, um, if the marriage is a portrayal of Christ's love for his church, well, who's watching? Think about who's watching your marriage. Think about that for a minute. When, when I do pre-marriage counseling for couples, I, I talk about the purposes of marriage. And, of course, we talk about companionship and sexuality and all those kind of things. But, I, but one of my talk is that there's a domestic purpose for marriage. If you read Titus, you know, it talks about how husbands and wives need to act a certain way because the younger people, the unmarried people, are watching. So think about it, you married couples. People are watching you. You're, you know, Leanna, we have four kids. Our kids are watching our kids are watching. So, so who's watching this? Who's, who's watching your marriage? And so if you're single, if you're going to get married, who's watching? If you've been divorced, if you're going through a struggle in your marriage, who's watching? I, I think we need to be aware of this. So let's talk about who's watching. First of all, you are. You, you're watching. Um, you learn the joy of self-sacrificial love by watching your own marriage. I've learned a lot about love by just being married, right? Second person that's watching is your spouse, right? They're watching. And that follows pretty closely. If, if I love my wife, Leanne, well, it will be easier for her to follow Christ. And the same thing, if she follows, if she loves me well, it'll be easier for me to follow Christ. So, so the spouse is watching. Thirdly, if you have kids, your kids are watching. And I'll just go ahead and kind of add another one. Your grandkids are watching, right? Um, think about it. I, some of you out here that have maybe younger kids that aren't of age to be married, you know, there's going to be a day, I'll just use you, uh, you know, Miss Bowman. Um, you know, think about, you know, let's say 10 years from now. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go 15 years from now. Caroline's sitting in my office, and she's with her fiancé. And they've asked me to do, you know, the wedding, right? And I'm kind of doing pre-marriage counseling. You know what I'm going to ask Caroline? I'm going to say, hey, Caroline, hey, tell me about what you know about marriage. What have you, what have you seen in your mom and dad? <laughs> right? I mean, don't you want her to say, wow, you know, I saw a, a, a man and a woman who loved God first, who loved each other second, and who loved me third. And, and, and they, they went through some struggles. They had tough times, but man, they always looked to God and they loved each other through that and they protected me and loved me. That's the kind of wife I want to be. Wouldn't you want her to, I mean, right? Couples, right? Wouldn't you want your kids to say something like that? So your kids are watching and, and folks, our marriages are profoundly shaping our child's deepest and most sincere theology. I want to say that again. Our marriages are shaping our children's theology. <laughs> That's convicting to me. Their understanding of who Jesus is, 
They're learning that from how they see me interact with my wife. Wow. Fourth, God's watching. Right? I mean, God, obviously, I just don't want to miss him, but, but he delights in being discovered for how delightful he really is in your marriage. He delights in that. So he's watching. And fourth, and lastly, I mean, people around you are watching. There, there's all kinds of people that you work with, your extended family, they're all watching. And they may not be able to articulate, you know, labels like Christ and church, but your, your marriage should look very distinctive to them. Let me just kind of say, let me just, lost people are watching your marriage. Your marriage should reflect Jesus Christ in a gospel kind of way. And so, if, let me, can I just say this is a bold statement, but if happiness, companionship, children, ministry, if that's the heart of your purpose statement for marriage, then God is not the center of your marriage. Let me say that again. If happiness and companionship and children and ministry are at the heart of your purpose statement for your marriage, then God's not the center of your marriage. And I think we all understand that God needs to be the center of the marriage. He may be involved in your marriage. and You may be seeking to follow him in your marriage, but he's not at the center. We've got to understand that marriage is about knowing God. Period, right? That's got to be number one, perceiving who he is and portraying who he is. And so the closeness of marriage, yes, can make you wonderfully happy. Anybody in here married over 50 years? Anybody? Over 50? Got a couple back there. Wow. You know, and I think these, these, these folks are people you need to talk to. These folks, I need to get up here and let them teach and let me just sit down and shut up and listen, right? I mean, because they've been through that process, right? They understand that the closeness of marriage kind of makes you wonderfully happy. But folks, let me kind of just say, if happiness is driving your marriage, your motivation for marriage, you're gonna look at your spouse deep down inside one day and you're gonna just say this, is this it? Because happiness is fleeting, if, 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 if your kids, if the ability to raise children together is one of the amazing privileges of marriages to you, one day your kid is going to grow up and move out of your house and they're going to be gone and you're going to say, is this it? And so you can, listen, can I just write this down? You can only love your spouse well if you love God more than your spouse. You can only love your spouse well only if you love God more than your spouse. He's got to come first. Driving that home. The driving force behind your marriage should be to know God and respond to him. This is why, listen, this is why I'm just telling you as your pastor, I do not perform wedding ceremonies for anybody who is not a Christian. Just don't. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, we'd love for you to do our wedding ceremony, and one of the two of them are not a believer, I can't in good conscience do it. Why? Well, because God's not at the center of their marriage. God's not even at the center of their life, right? I will, I will counsel with them. I will share the gospel with them. I will evangelize them. I will love them. I will encourage them. But I can't in good conscience perform a biblical union of marriage with two people who one of them's not saved, right? Because God has to be the center, and I believe in that, and that's, that's what we have to believe in as married folks. So, so the purpose statement for marriage means that marriage isn't, listen, marriage isn't fundamentally about what it produces, happiness, kids, wonderfulness, and all that kind of stuff. It's mainly about God. It's about how you, the two of you display God. So there's a purpose for marriage that's deeper than happiness, it's deeper than children, it's deeper than just doing ministry together. It's to perceive and portray the glory and goodness of God. Just, just, just let that sink in. For those of you who are married, the purpose of your marriage, number one, has to be biblically to perceive and portray the glory 
of God, period. But you know, when you talk to that young couple, oh, we're getting married in September and we just can't wait. We're just in love. Oh, I can't wait to be with him. And just, you know, I want a honeymoon. We just talk about all these crazy things and dresses and honeymoons and houses and dream vacation homes and blah, 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 blah. And we're going to have kids and we're going to name them this. And we're gonna blah, blah, blah. And, and it, but, but when nobody ever talks about, I can't wait to get with my spouse and perceive and portray the glory of God. That's never happened. I've done 114 weddings. I've never had a couple say that to me. Caroline will, though, when she, when she gets to that point, right? That's the purpose of marriage. Well, how does that happen? Well, that leads to our next point. Let's talk about the power of marriage. And I just want you to kind of grasp, this is kind of an introduction tonight. I'll get, I'll get through it. Genesis 2.18, as we have already read, God says he will make a helper fit for the man. So and if you read in verse 21, he creates Eve out of Adam. And Eve then is fit for Adam. What does that really mean? I looked at the Hebrew of that. I mean, for liter- literally that means she is, she is opposite him. Think about it. She, she is opposite him, all right? or corresponding to him. You could translate it that way as well. So the purpose of a marriage, man and wife, man and woman, is to perceive and to portray, but the man and the woman will not go about doing this in the same way. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Men and women are different. They're not gonna go about perceiving and portraying the glory of God in identical fashions because they're created differently from each other. And this is, this is the power of ma- marriage, folks. The power of marriage is that we're different. And some of you are talking, no, pastor, you've got that wrong. That's the frustration of marriage. That's what you're thinking, right? The power of marriage is not that we're different. No, that's, that's the frustrating part. I want her to be just like me, and she wants me to be just like her. You know, that's frustrating. But no, that's the power of it, folks. That's the power of it. Let me kind of explain a little bit more. That's the power of marriage. It's found in those differences. It's, Leanne and I could, I think you all know this biologically, but Leanne and I could not have children apart from each other. Correct? The sperm has to meet the egg. There has to be, con- y- y'all know how that works, right? I mean, that, that's bio- biology 101, right? We couldn't do that separate from each other. And so we, that's a part of, we couldn't in, enjoy sex apart from each other. We couldn't have a companionship apart from each other. We couldn't have a friendship apart from each other. It's through those differences that we learn about God and show who he is and, and we do all that stuff that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. And these differences, I think you all know men and women are different. I think we all understand that. There's differences in our bodies and there's differences in how we're made up. But it's not so much our roles as it's our orientation. I mean, the fact that Leanne is a female and I am a male, that's the whole point. That's the power of our marriage. Can I just say, and I'll just speak very clearly to this, it's not a marriage when it's a man and a man. It's not a marriage. We can call it here in our culture whatever we want, but it's not a marriage, folks. A woman and a woman, that's not a marriage. You can have a certificate signed by somebody, it's not a marriage. A man and a woman, that's a marriage. That difference, that power, that's the power of our marriage. But yet, here's what happens. And every married person will amen this when I say this. Because you get married and you have that honeymoon and everything's just perfect. Everything's just wonderful. And we just love each other. And then then you get home. And and from the honeymoon. And you know, he, he doesn't fold the clothes the right way, or she doesn't cook pork chops the right way, or he doesn't whatever. And, you know, and, and, then, and then you start saying things like this as a spouse. If you would just do it like, I, like me, we'll get along great. 
Y'all done that guilty, <laughs> right? And then, and, then, and then your spouse says, if you'll just, you know, kind of do it like me, we'll all be great. And we, we entirely miss the point of marriage. And so what happens is you, you argue about it and you finally kind of come to some kind of conclusion. And, you know, well, you just got to be like me. And, and then finally somebody will give in and say, okay, I'll just do it like you. And we somehow have peace. We think it's peace, but it's not peace. It's not peace. And very often it's those differences. You remember when you first met? You were different. I, I remember when I first met Leanne, I was a runner. I mean, I was running like 80 miles a week. I was, a, I was barely human. I was always sweating. I was always running. She hated to sweat. She didn't like running. She didn't like, I mean, she didn't like any of that stuff. And we, I mean, just opposites, but yet we fell in love. It was just weird. And we, we, you know, opposites attract, right? You've heard that opposites do attract. But folks, very often those differences that Tommy sometimes tend to drive us crazy, it's really the power of marriage. I preached in here not too long ago about the unity in the church. And we talked about our differences, all of our diverse different kinds of people. Getting together and unifying in the cause of Christ. That's powerful to a lost world. It's the same in marriage. A husband and a wife, fearfully and wonderfully made, come together in the oneness of marriage. It's powerful. It's powerful to a lost world. So, a key task in maybe the first few years of marriage, and I remember I went through this too, is, is to learn to trust those differences. I'm, I'm pretty OCD. Y'all, y'all, okay, I'll just tell a funny story. Y'all remember that story, Sleeping with the Enemy with Julia Roberts? Anybody ever seen that movie? Julia Roberts is married to the psycho guy. I mean, psycho, he's crazy, he's OCD, and everything has to be in order. Everything has to be, you know, towels in the bathroom have to be hanging at the same length, and all the soup labels have to be turned out. I mean, he's crazy, and, he, and, and she fakes her own death to get out of this marriage. You know, and it's as if it's a, we watch this, stupid, we watch this on our honeymoon. Dumb, just a stupid, and then, and then, and then, of course, I kind of had fun with it, and we got home, and, and I would look at her in the bathroom, and I would kind of take the towels, and I'd give her that evil look, and I'd kind of straighten them up, and she'd say, stop that, you know, it was crazy, and so, and, and what, what happened is in those first few years, we learned each other's differences. We're, by the way, 30 years, we're still learning that, right? I mean, it's still, it's still a, a work in progress, and what, what we're doing is that I know for me, I'm learning she doesn't think about things like I do. And that's a good thing. I'm learning that, that she's much more intuitive about things. She sees the bigger picture, and I don't see that, and I need what she has in my life. And I'm learning to kind of trust those differences. And, and, and when you all know, as married couples, there was a day in your marriage where that kind of flipped, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, I kind of like this. It's kind of weird that we're different, and it's powerful, Right? That's happened. So much of this series that we talk about in here is going to be a lot about those differences. Um, and we're going to talk about those in the roles of communication with each other to sex to children. We're going to talk about those things in here. Um, and so the differences, again, are the key to every task God will give a married couple. Right? Think about it. Every task that God gives a married couple, he's doing that knowing that you're two different people. And so that leads to our final point tonight is, is the paradox of marriage. Here's what I mean by that. The whole point of marriage, Genesis 2.20, is that the man and woman are different from each other. And yet Genesis 2.24 says this, they shall become what? One flesh. Different, yet one. That's a paradox, right? How can you be different and be one, right? How's that work? And it says, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast or cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I love that picture in Genesis 2.25. Here's Adam and Eve naked in the garden, the perfect man, the perfect woman. 
Adam's over there petting the tiger. Eve's over here petting the, I don't know, the duckbill platypus or something. They're completely naked, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Here's all of who I am. And there's no shame in that. It's a beautiful picture, right? I mean, we get that visual image, but folks, that's a beautiful picture of what a marriage is. A man and a woman, the difference is we're not perfect like in the Garden of Eden, but a man and a woman together, physically, emotionally, cognitively, financially, here I am. Here's all my successes. Here's all my flaws. And there's no shame in that. It's a beautiful picture of marriage. And what a beautiful picture this is. Nothing between them. I mean, here, not even a piece of cloth was between them and the power of all those differences. Yet, yet there's unity. There's oneness. There's oneness. And this begins, the Bible says in verse 24, it begins with leaving something. For this reason, a man leaves his mom and his dad. So, so men, listen to me. Ladies, listen to me. This means your spouse comes before everything. It comes before your parents. It comes before your job. Oh, but he's a mama's boy. It doesn't matter anymore. It's, that's, that's all. Those days are over. Right? Oh, but my job is, no, 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 no. Everything, job, friendships, hobbies, everything. You are shifting your allegiances so that your family of origin now becomes secondary to now your spouse. I love my mom and dad. They're still living and I love them. They raised me, they changed my diapers, they taught me how to talk and walk and, and help me with algebra homework and, and put band-aids on my knees when I was, you know, was, had bike wrecks. But there was a day on May 9th, 1992, that I, I kind of, I, I didn't leave them, but, but I said, Mom and Dad, you're now no longer the most important thing in my life. She is. She's number one. You're never going to come between she and I. Never. So this is how, what has to happen. It starts with leaving. So, and I, and I don't, get, I just listen, listen, listen. Financial dependence on parents. You know, sometimes in the South, we have what's called the weaning shed. You ever seen one of those weaning sheds where mom and dad have a big house and then they put a single wide in the front yard? And that's the weaning shed. And the, the, the young couple lives there until they kind of get ready and then they go off. I, you know, we, we see, but listen, financial dependence emotional closeness to maybe a mom and a dad, a reliance on them for advice, that can work to a level, but can also very much derail the process of having a godly biblical marriage. Listen to that. So beyond leaving, Genesis 2 instructs a new husband to hold fast or cleave to his wife, to be one flesh. Now, certainly that refers to sexual intimacy. But when Jesus referred to this verse in Mark 10, he speaks more broadly and he says, the two shall become one. The two shall become one. So one implication of this is just a fidelity, a devotion to each other. God's intent is for a man and a woman to stay together forever. But in this fast-paced culture, we, we make commitments and we break them rather quickly, right? We do that a lot of times in our culture today. But marriage is qualitatively different type of commitment. Folks, it's not a commitment. It's a covenant. I, I tell young couples, I do not want you to commit to each other. I don't. Because a commitment is something you're in charge of. You gotta surrender to each other. Just like I don't want you to commit to Jesus. I don't want you to be in charge of that. I want you to surrender to Jesus, right? And, and if there's this analogy of Christ being the bridegroom and we, the church, being the bride, and we're supposed to surrender to Jesus, then husbands and wives, we need to surrender to each other. It's a, it's a covenant. It's a permanent bond between two parties. And then the second implication here is it's holding fast or cleaving to. And so in marriage, there's this reorientation of priorities to make your spouse primary. She's got to become primary. 
He's got to become primary. Your, your posture toward everything in life changes. And this is where I see in, in our culture today, we mess marriage up. Well, I'm going to marry you, but I'm still going to work 60 hours a week. I'm going to marry you, but I'm still going to go and drink with the boys every night. I'm going to marry you, but I'm still going to go shopping all the time. You know, I mean, no, your posture toward life and everything changes. Marriage is now the context in which you live, period. So, so, so let me kind of just take like, as you approach your work, as you approach church, as you approach friendships, as you approach family, you are now a married man and a married woman, right? When you get married. So let's take your career, for example. Mary, listen to me. As a married person, you're not supposed to balance your career with your marriage. How many of y'all have ever been told that? You need to balance your marriage and your career. That's not biblical. You approach your career as a married person. That's different, right? Right? You don't try to balance the two and just, it's not, no, no. You, you approach your hobbies as a married person. You approach your, your schoolwork as a married person. You approach your career, your job as a married person. You approach your family as a married person. You approach your friends as a married person. It's different. It's different. And so this holding fast, this becoming one flesh is very, very complicated because man and woman are different from each other. But remember, that's the whole point, right? That's the power of marriage. The differences is what is, has the power in marriage. And so those differences are how they can experience life in one flesh. And so we're gonna look at this over the next several weeks. And again, I, I want you to come. I want you to bring friends. I want you to bring your neighbors, bring your dog, bring your whoever. We're going to look at, we're going to look at roles. We're going to look at communication. And yes, we're going to talk about sex. Because when used poorly, when those things, communication, sex, and roles, when those are used poorly, marriages start doing this, dividing. Used well, there's a oneness that gets stronger and, and it's significant and there's a completion and there's a, there's, a, there's a bond there. So again, the purpose of marriage, it's deeper than just happiness and having kids and doing stuff together. It's really about portraying and perceiving the image of God. And let me just kind of say this and I'll close with this and we'll go into prayer. Some people will tell you wrongly that that. Marriage um, is kind of the steady pace. You, you got to kind of get to know each other and you got to kind of pace yourself. And you got, I, I don't know that that's true, to be honest. And I think most of you would agree with this. It's, it, this is more David's opinion. I think marriage is built on a series of defining moments. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Those defining moments in your marriage, that, that birth of a child, that crisis, that first argument, that first, ooh, I, I should have forgiven her and I didn't. Or, ooh, I messed that up with him or I messed that up with her. Th those, those defining, having, launching a child off into you know, college or wherever, that's, those are defining moments. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Those defining moments as parents, uh, maybe, maybe a loss, maybe a health crisis, maybe a mountaintop experience you guys had that just, just knocked your socks off. I mean, all those are, are sometimes those defining moments. And I think it's how you respond to those moments and decisions that you make during those moments that make your marriage for better, or for worse, right? And those responses will flow from what you want from your marriage. If, if you just want a BFF, did y'all, she's my best friend. If that's all you want, that's where you're gonna get probably. If you, all you want is just a happy family or all you want maybe is just look like a happy family or maybe you just want security, but deeper and more fundamentally, more than that, 
The question is for your marriage is do you want God? Are you going to be open enough to have God at the center of your marriage and he and you perceive his glory and portray his glory? Jesus' words, and I'll close with this, in Matthew 6, 33, are so pertinent to our study of marriage. Most of you don't hear this verse in the context of marriage, but it says this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? All these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom. This is the path to marriage as God has intended it. I, I, draw, I draw a triangle to a lot of couples with God being up here at the top apex and husband and wife being down here. And what a lot of times we do as husbands and wives is we start, I'm gonna be the best husband in the world. I'm gonna be the best wife in the world. I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna give you gifts. I'm gonna love you. And we try to, you try to get closer that way when really the reality is this. That never works. Somebody's gonna mess up because you're human. But husband, you've got to get closer and closer and closer to God. Wife, you've got to get closer and closer and closer to God. You've got to get closer and closer and closer. And what happens? As you're getting closer to God, what's happening? You're getting closer to what? Each other. God has to be center. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, thank you for just letting your scripture speak to us tonight and, and just reminding us that our marriages are really not about happiness or contentment or kids or just doing things together and having companionship. But Lord, it's really about portraying and perceiving the image and the glory of God. God, marriage is a divine institution that you created. And every person in this room, including me and my wife, Leanne, we have messed that up in so many ways. And God, forgive us. So draw us back to the original scriptural concept of marriage, of perceiving and portraying your glory, recognizing our differences as man and, and woman, and becoming together and holding fast together and being one flesh. And so God, for the married couples in the room, I just pray that um, maybe tonight, maybe a different perspective has been released and maybe they can talk about that. Maybe there's good discussions around the dinner table or at bedtime at night. For the single people in the room, I pray, Lord, that they're getting a better idea of what marriage is about. And maybe even for the people in the room that maybe their marriage in some areas are struggling. Maybe this is, a, this is a point of reconciliation and restoration. So God, will you work and move in marriages in our church? Will you work and move in the lives of single people? God, maybe they're single for a reason. Maybe they're single on purpose. Let them know that, God, they're still made in the image of you. They have a purpose. They have a meaning. But God, we thank you for the principle of marriage that you've given us in your word. So God, guide us and lead us, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.